context of talent and attraction and selection, Ajay, do social media enable HR managers in talent search, or is there a hidden hidden agenda for technology giants in terms of profiting by manipulation and advertising? Look, it's a, it's a difficult point, Anjali. It's mm. we know that um, that social manager that social media can mm. can enable us in terms of our talent search. We've seen lots of examples and. You know, LinkedIn, it's great for, mm -hmm. for recruiting. You know, people put up job advertisements and it's like, hey, we're looking for someone. It's quick, it's easy. We can get the applications coming in. Mm -hmm. You know, Facebook sites, it's, you know, social media is certainly taking over there and those 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 online platforms for recruitment are, mm -hmm. are, are the world of, of talent search. But there are some issues. We know that applicant tracking systems are used by mm. the vast majority of employers yeah. in this Asia Pacific region and um, they're cheap. And it also takes a lot of the time out of that recruitment process for HR people. And the students reading the book and, and watching these videos may be surprised to learn that their, their job applications yeah. for the most part are not going to be seen in the first mm. instance by a human being. An applicant tracking system will determine the shortlist based on keywords alone. What are the emerging employee retention strategies of the 21st century workforce? Complicated. <laughs> <laughs> uh, there, it's, you know, no longer um, from an HR point of view, can we have this one size fits all mm. strategy for retention? It's very much about tailoring to individual needs moving forward. Um, I think there's recognition of that not our, all our employees want the same things and they're at different stages of their careers. And trust, you know, trust and respect are actually huge retention issues. You know, I think as mm. with COVID, it's like, wow, managers have worked out they can trust their employees. So to actually start to trust mm. and respect um, are actually really big retention strategies. So a lot of this is around the intrinsic, the intrinsic factors, not necessarily the extrinsic rewards, and providing opportunities for employees to build skill sets um, that will equip them for that lattice career they have going forward. That it's not necessarily about promoting them to management levels. What we're seeing more and more mm. of is people going, you know what, I don't want the management role. I would actually, I love what I do. I just want some difference. Yep. I would like to be involved in different projects and build new knowledge and different skill sets and to actually provide those opportunities in a different different way. So it's all it is complicated. It's around tailoring to the needs of our employees. So right, Jen, but it's so sad that I haven't experienced much and haven't seen much retention strategies anywhere. I have worked in, you know, we leave a job, you resign, or there are other circumstances, but, you know, there are such wonderful workers out there who, you know, who've not had those kind of advantage or benefit for being a good worker. Exactly. And it's, you know, it's, it's never all about the money. And um, yeah. I think when, when, you know, the students who read our textbooks think, you yeah. know, what do you mean? It's not all about the money. Yes. When you get your first job, it is about the money, but to keep you there, is about more than money. It's about the respect. It's about knowing who you are as a person, knowing what you want out of the work. And from employers, it's, you know, employees actually yeah. cost a lot now because we're employing people for, mm -hmm. you know, their critical thinking, their emotional intelligence, their adaptability. We're paying a lot for that. So Ooh, yeah. you know, we've got to mm -hmm. do, we've got to do this stuff to retain them retain that incredible talent that is this is coming out into the future of work. Welcome to the 11th edition of Human Resource Management Strategy and Practice interview series. I'm honored and excited to have Professor John Shields. He will present his views on managing of performance and strategic reward management. John Shields is a professor of human resource management and organizational studies in the University of Sydney. He works in the area of performance management, reward management, and corporate governance. May I begin this interview by asking the question, how is technology reshaping the future of performance management and how did this augur well or badly for the workplace experience? Thank you, Anjali. 
Performance management is in a state of profound paradox, I think, and it's really impossible to fully appreciate the double-edged impact of technological change on this really key mm. HR process without first understanding the predicament that now actually defines performance management. So what is this paradox? Well, on the one hand, what we have is um, uh, an assumption by HR practitioners that performance management um, is the key or core means to managing organisational talent. And it's been regarded that way for a long, long time. But the terrible truth is that performance management is now also one of the most widely loathed and feared of all HR practices. It causes stress, anxiety and pain for employees and managers alike. And on top of that, despite it being a massive field of academic research for well over 40 years now, there's hardly any credible evidence that performance management as traditionally practiced delivers organizations any discernible positive payoff for the vast amount of time that it absorbs. So critics of formal or traditional performance management single out a range of problems with this approach. They say that it's degenerated into an empty annual ritual, the once a year tick and flick exercise that everyone hates and no one takes seriously. If you like, a bureaucratic nightmare that comes around uh, each anniversary. It's really the formal performance ratings process that's seen as the bugbear, the real problem. It requires masses of highly subjective behavioral observation and scoring of behavioral observation by supervisors, scoring that's prone to both cognitive error through information overload and also deliberate manipulation. And that's a sure recipe for burnout and disengagement, the very things that HR practitioners want to avoid. And some, of the, some of the world's biggest firms, Deloitte, Accenture, Microsoft and others, abandoned formal performance rating and review practices altogether in favour of what are now called informal methods. How is generational change affecting employees' regard expectations and performances? And how are organisations responding to these changes? Okay, so because I'm an academic, I'm going to start with a definition. A reward is anything, yeah, anything that an employee sees as being valuable to them in meeting their needs and expectations at work. If the reward that's offered isn't meaningful and valuable as a need satisfier, it won't get the employee motivated and engaged with their work. That's an important start point. Mm. But what is potentially rewarding to people doesn't mean um, just the pay they receive. There are other forms of reward as well. There are rewards to do with developing your personal skills and capabilities and knowledge. There are social rewards of being in a supportive and friendly and fun workplace. Then there are, are what we call intrinsic rewards flowing from the job or position that you're assigned to. An intrinsic reward is one that relates to the individual's genuine interest mm -hmm. and enthusiasm for the job. Is it a great job? Is it a boring job? If it's a great job, you're likely to draw intrinsic reward from that. And that's about job design rather than the pay mm -hmm. offer. Um, and one of the real conundrums facing HR managers these days is working out what types of rewards, pay, developmental, social, intrinsic, actually strike a chord with their employees. But, you know, even pay itself is a complicated matter because when it comes to pay or compensation, as the Americans call it, um, there's not just fixed or guaranteed pay, the pay we call base pay, there's also performance pay for individuals and teams. And then there are things that we refer to as benefits, things like paid leave, superannuation contributions by the organisation, and fun stuff like wellness programs. So pay itself is a variegated and complicated reward configuration um, consideration. So that's the definitional matter. Secondly, 
Um, everyone who is in the workplace bears not one identity, but multiple identities. Identities that shift the personal needs and expectations of each individual over time. So at any given moment in time, an employee might define themselves and their needs and expectations in terms of say their gender, their parental status, their occupation, their education level, their union membership or non-membership, their age, and the generational identification. There are others as well. Now, to go to the issue of, of generations, due to the combination of rising life expectancy and later retirement age, it's the age factor, the generational factor, that's now a front of mind consideration for award managers and other HR professionals. You see, this is the first time in human history that so many different generations are present in the workplace at the same time. There are baby boomers, my generation in their 60s, we're still there. There are Gen X in their 40s and 50s. There are Gen Ys or millennials in their 30s. And then there are Gen Zs in their early 20s, those born this century. And that's you. The bulk of our students are, are Gen Zers. By the way, barring any accidents that you might experience, your generation can now expect to live until you are a century old and you are likely to be still working in your 70s. Some people say that there is more variation in needs and expectations within generational groups than there are between them. And I think there's a degree of truth in that, but let's not quibble about that. Let's engage in some shameless age stereotyping and let's pick on your generation stereotype, the Gen Zers. So here's one set of characteristics that are said to define your generation, Gen Zers, your social attitudes and your work attitudes compared to those of your parents and your grandparents. So here we go. Don't be offended. Your generation are said to be the first true digital natives, the first generation born in the age of the internet and growing to maturity in the age of the internet and everything that goes with that social media, et cetera, et cetera. Um, you are the first genuinely social media savvy generation. You work to live, not live to work. You seek instant gratification at work. You want it all and you want it now and you want constant accolades. You seek development, developmental opportunities in your workplace. Remember, developmental awards, an important aspect of reward management options. You are environmentalists, so you put the planet before profit. Weirdly, you're also more pessimistic about the impact of robotics than older generations, though you're also better ad adapted um, to technological change. You might want to contemplate why that is. You have a preference for online entrepreneurship over paid employment. So do your online startup um, and away you go. So compared to old, older generations, what reward practices are being used to appeal to your generation, the Gen Z mindset? All right, here we go. Forget about childcare support. Forget about extra paid sick leave. Forget about subsidized health insurance. These are not the things that will motivate you. You can wait until you're really ancient in your 30s before you have to look to those uh, reward options. The reward enticements that are being used to attract, retain and motivate your generation include things like these. Super task diverse and exciting jobs for intrin intrinsic motivation, that other reward element, in-house developmental opportunities like coaching, paid progression based not on, top, not on how many years you've been in the job, but on demonstrated growth in personal skills and knowledge. Flexible working hours so that you can balance more effectively work and play. Wellness and fitness programs. Paid leave opportunity to, to, to participate in environmental protection, sustainability and other 
programs, including so, uh, programs to support the socially disadvantaged. So you are a generation with a profound environmental and social conscience, and you look to reward opportunities in the, in the workplace um, along those lines as well. Look, the point I'm really trying to make here is that HR managers now face a real challenge, balancing the rewards they offer to different generations of employees. It would be madness and hugely costly to try to fine tune reward packages for each generational cohort. That would simply be impossible to administer. So the rewards that might appeal to baby boomers in their 60s are likely to be incredibly different to the award offers that would appeal to your generation in your 20s. However, the clever way forward here is to empower individual employees to make their own choices about how they're rewarded and how their award packages are configured. And this might be the best way to cover the fact that variation in employee needs, expectations and reward preferences varies as much within as between generations. So let the individual, irrespective of their age bracket, make a reasonable choice. That doesn't mean making a choice of their pay level, but it does mean potentially being able to make a choice between fixed pay and variable pay, between developmental rewards and financial or monetary rewards, social awards and developmental rewards, intrinsic rewards and other sorts of rewards. These are the sorts of permutations of reward practice configuration that HR and reward managers now wrestle with. And you know what? I can't think of a more compelling reason why being a reward management specialist is such an important and exciting professional role, one combining insights from psychology, sociology, economics, and strategic management. It has it all. Enjoy. Thank you. Thank you so much, John. Impressive, because I really like what you said about the the reward expectations. You know, everybody loves to be rewarded. But do you think with this new normal, uh, people working from home, they've missed out such wonderful get-togethers. <laughs> Those rewards has been missed out. So Indeed. what is the organizations going to do about it? Like, how do they, you know, make their staff motivated? At the same yes, time, so that's a, that, that's, a, yep, that's a very good point. I mean, mm -hmm. temporarily, uh, working from home means that um, the face-to-face -face social awards that many of us, myself included, look forward to in the workplace mm -hmm. are not available to us. The closest we can get is via the, you know, um, uh, cyberspace, Zoom conversations. Um, but that's generally seen as a relatively poor substitute for having you know, close, uh, personal, informal chats um, around the coffee maker or whatever happens Absolutely. to be in the workplace. And mm -hmm. a lot of people that find those social engagements as informal and casual mm -hmm. as they are, yeah. extremely important both to their motivational state and also their psychological and emotional well-being. So in the short run, organisations can only seek to compensate indirectly, um, you know, the People who are extroverts will probably feel the loss of the social engagement most profoundly because that's how they get their energy. People who are more introverted, and about 40% of you know, a normally distributed human population are likely to be on the introverted side of the spectrum. Introverts don't care so much about that. They're quite happy um, to recharge by themselves rather than to have to rely on relationships to do that. Um, but there are ways that organisations can temporarily bridge, bridge the gap. And for example, you can have online team meetings um, and you can have Friday fun days where you're doing um, you know, informal um, game plays and that sort of thing. Um, but again, they're temporary substitutes for the real thing. Um, what we know is that um, organisations are moving to uh, make uh, developmental opportunities available particularly to Gen Zers to retain them. If there's real talent there, and you know, there certainly is in that generation, um, then um, offering them an exciting and varied job, offering developmental opportunities, um, offering them a sense of purpose 
not just attachment to the profit motive. These are the things that are really important. And, you know, the critical player in all this is the supervisor. Yes. The message totally. that comes from the supervisor mm -hmm. around both performance management and reward management is mission critical to the success or failure of those practices in terms of employee engagement and organisational survival and success. Absolutely. Thank you so much. Thank you so much for your time, John. I don't want to stop. I'd rather keep going. <laughs> Professor Marian Bird will present her views on managing work health and safety and workplace negotiation process. In the context of managing work health and safety, what human resource strategies would you suggest to help reduce the growing gap in retirement savings between men and women? Well, this is a big issue that goes not just to work health and safety, but mm -hmm. also to performance and reward management. Um, now, we know that women's and men's pays are different and they their gap starts from the moment women and men go into the workforce. Mm -hmm. So that gap that we see amongst graduates in the workforce continues to grow. For women particularly, then there are interruptions to their careers, mm -hmm. typically having children, leaving the workforce to raise the family for a period of time, and later in their lives to um, move into elder care roles, care of older parents and relatives. So we see a lot of disruptions in women's working lives. That compounds the pay gap. But the other big issue is that through that process in Australia, we contribute to superannuation, that is our retirement funding or our pension system. And um, when women leave the workforce or reduce their hours of work, their superannuation contributions are lower. So we end up at the end of their working lives with them having a much greater superannuation um, gap so that their retirement income is much less than men's. And this is an area that um, HR management, reward management and equality management need to be really cognizant of and think about ways to overcome that gap. Fantastic. And finally, please tell us about effective negotiation skills for workplace success. So when we talk about negotiation skills, we can think about negotiation in terms of a, an individual negotiating with their manager, or B, a group of workers negotiating with management. And these are two quite different processes. Mm -hmm. So individuals negotiating with their managers relies on the individual having enough knowledge about what it is they're negotiating for, and usually it will be pay and working hours. Um, and that puts individuals in quite a difficult position because the individual never has as much power as the manager in that situation. Mm -hmm. So in order for an individual to do the best out of that, they need to be well prepared. They need to get as much information and data as they possibly can. And they should go into that negotiation with a sense of knowing what it is they want to achieve out of the negotiation. When we move to collective negotiation, that's usually done via someone who represents the group. And in Australia, that is usually through a union. Now that allows workers to have a lot more um, guidance and a lot mm -hmm. more strength in their negotiations because they get the, the benefit of the collective knowledge and the collective power. And in Australia, those collective negotiations determine much of our workplace conditions especially the baseline conditions of hours of work, um, mm -hmm. pay, benefits around training and development, um, loadings for extra work that people might be doing over time. All of those things are negotiated collectively. So we have to think about negotiations that way in two sets, individual and collective. Interesting. Just one thing, Marianne, when we look at the collective and individual, we talk about union and non-union members. Would you yes. say so that non-union members are more individual and the unions are more collective? So is this still happening? Like, Yes, we, we do have an um, uniquely in Australia, mm -hmm. a situation where a group of people who don't belong to a union can mm -hmm. gather together to negotiate with an employer. Mm -hmm. That's called non-union bargaining. Mm -hmm. It's not that widespread. It's not as 
common as union bargaining and it's generally not as effective. The data show that they don't necessarily do as well in bargaining as union mm -hmm. bargaining. Oh, fantastic. Thank you so much for your time, Mary, and thank you. My pleasure. Thank you. And I hope students enjoy the textbook and learning.